Thanks, Zena. Thanks, Zena. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. <clears throat> My name is Nate Broadbridge, and I'm uh, actually with the Ovative Group. Uh, we hail from Minneapolis, Minnesota. Uh, we like to call ourselves uh, a measurement and activation firm, uh, which to us means the blend between uh, analytics and digital marketing. We uh, strive to use data-driven insights uh, to help our clients optimize their, uh, their media spend and unlock the potential of their brands uh, in the digital marketplace. Primarily, uh, we focus on a, a client list that spans across many verticals, uh, some of which are listed here. Uh, and we also uh, partner with uh, digital marketing technology firms uh, to add a layer of, of deeper analytical focus uh, around the client's usage of their platforms. Uh, Live Ramp listed below, uh, my personal favorite and partner in crime on this discussion, uh, is, is listed here. And Ovative and LiveRamp have been working together for several years now on uh, a few clients, and we'd like to share uh, some of that work with you guys today. And uh, Jason Reese is also on the line, and I'll let him uh, share a bit about what LiveRamp does. All right. Thanks, Nate. Um, so I am Jason Reese. I work for LiveRamp as a customer success manager. I work with some of our largest enterprise brands, agencies, and media companies to help them connect uh, various sets of data using a persistent uh, ID to help them further advance their digital marketing efforts. Um, I want to start today by talking a little bit about uh, what LiveRamp does, uh, both our product offering and the way that we engage with our clients. Um, and then we will uh, hand it back over to Nate, who will discuss some of the ways Ovative puts our technology to use. Uh, for some of their largest uh, retailers. So uh, first, a, a bit of perspective on the marketplace. I think it's probably not news to anyone listening today that we're a connected culture and consumers are interacting across all types of devices. And you know, the more devices that uh, individuals are using, the more data becomes available uh, to be able to interact with these folks. Um, now, with this huge amount of data, the question becomes, how can we really leverage it? And when we think about the scale of what's being generated and where this comes from, uh, so according to the uh, International Data Corporation, which is a leading uh, marketing intelligence firm, uh, right now we're sitting on roughly about eight zettabytes of data that's being created uh, on a yearly basis from around 250 billion connected devices. Uh, if you all aren't familiar with a zettabyte, it's about a million times larger than a terabyte. So these are pretty uh, significant uh, data quantities. Um, and of course, this is only going to grow over the next 10 years as the number of devices really um, begins to proliferate um, as you know, different types of connected devices beyond mobile into smartwatches, connected cars, and Internet of Things uh, really become more mainstream and make more data available um, about their users. And in parallel to this huge explosion of data, uh, we, of course, have uh, a, a pretty significant expansion in the marketing and ad tech ecosystem. Uh, year over year, over the last five years, we're seeing roughly double the number of vendors um, in the market, and, and that's really expected to continue. We're starting to see some signs of uh, mergers and consolidations, but those have been ever-present for you know, several years now, and it hasn't really slowed the rate of growth. Uh, in, in terms of new vendors entering the market. And some some companies choose uh, to select best of breed point solutions. Some buy into a stack. Um, but typically, you know, a, a given digital marketer is going to be using several different uh, platforms to execute across channels. And so one of the things uh, that, that really helps frame this up for consumers is obviously, uh, you know, as a marketer, you want to try to build a unified customer view. But to do this, you have to have a few key elements in place. Um, one, you have to actually know not just who your consumer is, but how to actually reach them, where they are. Um, you also need to have data about those consumers that can be easy, easily actioned upon. So, you know, Data is great for analysis, but if you can't really do much with it um, you know, to refine and optimize your approach to digital marketing, 
uh, then you're not getting as much value out of that data you hold. And, and lastly, um, being able to connect all of your technology platforms together using a common language of uh, persistent identifiers is really critical to understanding those consumers uh, on an, uh, if you will, apples to apples basis across all these different types of channels and identifiers that in some way or another represent your customer. And so this challenge is one that LiveRamp has really taken to heart uh, and something that we for several years now have been doing um, to help connect the vast marketing and ad tech ecosystem. So if you think about the t different types of identifiers that exist in the uh, marketing you know, space today, we have all the traditional types of offline identifiers that are often used for things like direct mail or email campaigns. And these are, these are identifiers that really represent that person you know, explicitly or can be considered PII. So things like first and last name, postal address, phone number, and email address, um, and of course, all the various uh, demographic and segment attributes you might have stored alongside this information are great for building direct audiences to target. Uh, but there is also a whole world of online identifiers that also represent these folks that are not necessarily PII, um, but, but that still represent that individual and the actions they're taking. Um, and so LiveRamp's vision for this is to say, you know, no matter what the different identifiers coming in are, whether they're PII or mobile device IDs or cookies, we can resolve them down to a central persistent ID that represents a person um, and links that person to the various devices uh, and offline attributes that you know about them. And being able to deploy this identity link throughout the ecosystem uh, is where LiveRamp brings a lot of value to marketers who are executing uh, their campaigns across channels and across various marketing platforms. I want to walk you through quickly uh, what one of these workflows through LiveRamp might look like and how the identity link from LiveRamp plays a key role in connecting together uh, technology platforms for cross-channel targeting. So in this use case, we have a retailer who is bringing to LiveRamp offline data, such as CRM data uh, or point of sale and transaction data, we onboard this data, recognizing the PII within and linking that to our recognition engine, uh, which for those of you familiar with our parent company is Axiom Abilitech. And these identifiers are stripped and assigned an anonymous uh, one-way hash and appended to the central identity link. When you're ready to target these known individuals on your digital channels, LiveRamp maintains partner syncs with roughly 400 partners in, that, in the marketing ecosystem, um, major social networks, display networks, programmatic video, search, um, and many more. And we sync our ID spaces with those of these downstream uh, ad serving and media partners and send to them the IDs they need to target through their platforms. So in a sense, we are converting offline uh, CRM and transaction data directly to the digital IDs needed to find those users out in the ecosystem. Taking this one step further, once these users have actually been targeted uh, on the device or user or cookie level, we're able to bring these impressions and exposure events back into LiveRamp and resolve them back to that same central persistent anonymous identifier, thus creating a more seamless view of the customized uh, sales and CRM data and all of their online web behaviors uh, and allowing the, the marketer to create a seamless view of activity across channels. This can be used, of course, for analytics and determine how campaigns performed at the person level rather than the cookie or device level. And it can also be used to rebuild audiences for retargeting, um, thus completing the marketing analytics loop um, and allowing you to do things like in-flight optimization um, and really you know, refining your campaign approach to targeting individuals over time. Long story short though, the real goal of LiveRamp is to help marketers connect uh, their known first party and third party data sets with one of over 400 integrated partners uh, that we work with, um, thus being able to put ourselves in the position of uh, being a central identity resolution provider for marketers who are deploying data throughout the ecosystem. Uh, and we set this up so that uh, both brands and their agencies, their technology partners, 
and their data providers can all speak the same language. Um, and we know that uh, through my work with Ovative Group, I know that they are really good at this. Uh, so I'd like to hand the reins back over to Nate. Um, and he's going to talk a little bit about how Ovative leverages our technology uh, to serve their largest client. Thanks, Jason. Yeah, and you know, great capabilities are now available, right? LiveRamp is doing something that's uh, very new in the marketplace. And the question that we typically get from clients is, you know, how can they harness this ability uh, to enable more powerful testing on the digital space? And then, you know, we like to take that one step further and try to identify uh, ways in which to use the insights to change tactic strategy going forward. To not only get good results from the test, but then be able to, uh, you know, rely on those as uh, significant enough to drive a strategic change within an organization. We really see uh, a strategy, a robust A-B testing strategy as kind of the foundation uh, to answering this question. What we're going to go through today uh, allows for a company to infer uh, statistically significant results uh, across different testing groups uh, during a testing period um, to measure the true incremental lift that one tactic had over the other. Um, this is a fairly straightforward concept, right? Did one group perform better than the other? Test and control, fairly uh, um, fairly classic uh, example here, but actually going through this process and making sure that the data stays consistent uh, throughout the life of uh, the consumer record uh, through this whole process uh, is a lot trickier than somebody might expect if they've never done this before. Um, and a significantly uh, rigorous process around uh, making sure this data is kept consistent will allow be the best inferences to be made on the end of a test campaign. So we're going to go through a couple of things today. Um, we're going to go through that pro process structure for testing, um, setting up uh, the proper team members, uh, having making sure that everybody knows and understands their responsibilities. We're going to go through uh, an example of an A-B test, um, and then we're going to nerd out at the end uh, about uh, how to do kind of a post-test analysis um, to measure a statistical significance of a lift that may be observed uh, during an A-B test. So uh, first off, we want to just kind of level set why Ovative uh, thinks that identity resolution that, that's offered by LiveRamp is so powerful. Um, and kind of the key factor here that we see is um, we are now able to effectively, you know, segment these test and control groups. But then more, more importantly, uh, LiveRamp allows the ability to manage the exposure very tightly in display media of those two groups. Um, and it's that managed exposure that allows for best channel incrementality testing. So how does it all work, right? Well, um, from the client's perspective, you know, you have your customer records within your CRM. You're going to identify some, some master cohort that you would like to uh, conduct a test with, You're going to split them into, you know, a test and control segment, and send that data on over to LiveRamp. And as Jason mentioned earlier, uh, at that time, uh, the personal information of your customers is removed and instead replaced with an anonymous identifier that can be shared with the uh, media delivery partner of your choice. And it's at that point that you manage the uh, test and control messaging between both of those groups. Now, it's really the measurement here that we, that we care the most about, right? And while uh, sending uh, display messaging throughout the web, uh, it's not a guarantee that every person from both of these cohorts would be receiving media. Um, so probably don't want to, uh, to write a PhD thesis on this, but this is getting us leaps and bounds ahead of where we see clients' capabilities in, in display testing today. Because when you know that one particular cohort could only possibly see one particular type of media, that's very powerful when comparing to their counterparts that were only able to see the alternate type of media. And so it's this process that we want to talk through today to ensure that data is kept consistent through this entire work stream, and so that measuring on the back end uh, to store and online sales um, is, is deemed, uh, you know, appropriate to be done. 
So we're going to go ahead and, and, and go through the uh, process in which we would execute a campaign. Um, and it really kind of comes down to these three key pieces. And we see this um, a lot with clients. They'll either have one, maybe two of these. Um, but we really see all three as crucially important. And the overarching uh, message here is that uh, consistency needs to be had with communication across all three of these points. The team members need to know what their responsibilities are and what the goals of each test and or campaign are. Uh, the process in which data moves from client to live ramp to display partner uh, to impression needs to be well understood. And everybody needs to agree upon a system of record in which to measure the performance of the different tactics throughout the life of the campaign. So what we see typically um, is that partners often work independently of one another. Um, you know, the client teams are, are focused on, on their internal goals, as is the agency, and, and uh, LiveRamp helps bridge that gap. Jason, have you seen uh, a lot of this also in, in your work with clients? Yeah, I think some of the some of the most difficult challenges that that we encounter with marketing organizations you know, comes down to a, a few things. So, one, obviously, there are going to be usually distinct channel owners for each um, each media channel. So, whether that's offline or online, um, and you know, in thinking about ways to actually orchestrate that messaging across channels, uh, getting those various silos in a sense broken down, or at least getting those teams aligned is really critical to, to success and making sure that you know, the goal is singular and that everyone is on the same page with what you're trying to achieve. Um, secondly, I think uh, the question of data ownership is, is really critical as well. Um, thinking about the, the types of data that is used to build these segments, it's often first party CRM or sales data. There can also be third party data coming in from uh, data providers or other technology platforms. Um, and all the various uh, stakeholders in sourcing and getting that data into the right format um, also need to be well aligned uh, in order to pull this off seamlessly. Um, and so having, having uh, a champion who can really help uh, break that down, whether it's internal on the client side or whether it's you know, brought to you through an agency, um, is really kind of the the icing on the cake, if you will, to help to help these things go smoothly. Yeah, I mean, we we're seeing the same things on our end too, and we really try to push um, clients, the clients and their agency partners, um, you know, to think across uh, team members through uh, different partners and and really know who their key points of contact is, are um, across each one of their their collaboration partners. Um, we kind of have them separated here by um, by teams. You know, we've got planning team, measurement team, launch team, um, and we really think of these teams uh, as as partners with each other, and then also uh, partners across the teams, right? So the planning team can't operate in a silo. Neither can the measurement team. Neither can the launch team. So we want to make the focus uh, more about cross uh, partner collaboration, but also not not lose sight of the fact that each team needs to be communicating with themselves or be with each other uh, as well. I'm going to talk a little bit here now about the planning team first. So the goal of the planning team we see is really um, to do a couple of things. First, um, they're tasked with conducting some sort of upfront analysis on a target segment, uh, product category, uh, performance on both of those areas in general, um, and identifying a hypothesis on a tactic level change uh, that they could ostensibly make uh, to drive better performance. Now, this is one thing that that Ovative, you know, we really like uh, being upfront in that process, I, identifying these goals um, and making sure that hypotheses are created uh, in an actionable way um, is something that can seem uh, fairly simple up front, uh, but if not done uh, with the correct precision, can be hard to actually measure against uh, down the line. Uh, the planning team is also tasked with uh, determining the tactics and KPIs that are going to be used uh, during a campaign. Um, you know, we see a wide variety of this uh, in our work. Uh, Jason, you want to share any examples from kind of other verticals uh, that you see as uh, particularly interested in uh, any one of these these metrics here on the board? 
Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so, you know, obviously there's a lot of different standard KPIs like the ones Nate has up here on the screen. Um, but these could really be anything. Uh, some can be more difficult to measure or really quantify than others. Um, it may be something that can easily be tracked like an event registration or an app install, uh, depending on what you're really trying to get the customer to do. Um, is this a direct sales tactic? Is this more of an awareness or prospecting tactic? Um, and it, it could be something that is, is definitely much more difficult to measure, um, or at least you know think about driving, uh, such as in-store traffic. Um, so there are a lot of things to consider and plan for ahead of time to make sure that by the time your campaign is done, you actually have everything you need to successfully measure your approach, um, and that you know that goal having been defined at the start, um, can actually be followed through um, on the backside of the campaign. Yeah, I, you know, I think that's exactly right, Jason. And that's really the point in which the measurement team uh, needs to be engaged um, because it's ultimately going to be up to them to ensure that the data that's being sent from client to LiveRamp to publishing partner uh, is kept consistent throughout that process, right? And, you know, the client's analytics team They'll be tasked with creating the CRM segment files, right? And and a component of that is to relay with the broader group um, sample test size uh, information, like how large is your audience, uh, what other types of attributes do these customers have that they that client knows about, right? What's their existing transaction history? All these components of the customer uh, that is known by the client needs to be tightly managed and and well known throughout the throughout the group. The campaign manager, on the other hand, you know, they're tasked with ensuring that the proper media delivery partner is chosen uh, in order to reach the audience. Uh, defined by client uh, in a way that's most meaningful to engage those customers. And then the, the customer success manager from LiveRamp then is obviously going to ensure that uh, proper setup is created between LiveRamp and those partners uh, to make sure that the proper data is sent, the proper audiences will be queued to receive messaging, uh, and that everybody understands the timing, the match rates, the general process between point A and point B. After all of that is kind of you know documented and, and understood, then it comes down to the launch team kind of executing and, and really shepherding this process through uh, to completion. IT team is going to make sure that uh, proper security is in place between uh, client servers and, and live ramps. Media manager is going to be making sure that you know the audience that shows up within uh, their particular media delivery platform uh, is kept separate from other campaigns that may be run so as not to confuse the measurement on the back end during a test. And then, uh, you know, the LiveRamp team and the publishing partner are going to make sure that data is being synced and IDs are being shared uh, appropriately on a consistent manager or on a consistent manner between both of their platforms. All the while, you know, everybody needs to be consistently messaging each other, sharing points uh, that they are at in the process. Um, keeping everybody abreast of any issues that may pop up. And really what we see uh, is kind of the, the critical factor to, to successfully delivering a test is that everybody's on the same page and that they've thought through each step of the process before they pull the trigger. So this is something that you can share with, with your organizations. I mean, it's a, it's a good representation of how the planning team and the measurement team and the launch team all function uh, as one, but really that they all need to be on the same page and that this is the end goal of the entire process. It's to deliver the right media to the right person at the right time and be able to measure the correct uh, conversion parameters on the back end after or during a campaign uh, such that you can draw insights out of the uh, tactic that was chosen to be tested. I've talked a little bit about you know the, the point of sale purchases on the back end. Really, it's this key piece here on the client side that is um, going to be the factor on measuring the lift between uh, tactics, right? So, as you generate your customer segments within your CRM, send them to LiveRamp for the display process. Well, you also need to flag those customers on the back end such that when they make purchases that are related to the test that's being run, those are recorded partitioned, 
and then you're able to run analysis after the campaign is concluded uh, based, on, based on those performances. And we find that the point of sale transaction data works the best because it's real time, it's on a customer level, and you can break it down by SKU if you'd like, or uh, whatever product categories your company you know, is, is uh, seeking insights on. So now let's kind of bring this to life by, by going through an example. Um, the nice thing about this example is, albeit simple, uh, it can be translated to uh, any industry, any company that really has a primary good and a complementary good, and they'd like to test messaging to entice purchasing of the complementary good. In this scenario, we'll talk through a retailer that wants to drive athletic socks sales for customers who've already purchased athletic shoes. So going back to the, the team here, right? The planning team needs to collaborate on how to create a testing hypothesis that's actually actionable uh, using the capabilities that they have today. The measurement team is then gonna talk through and, and, and understand with the planning team uh, what levers are going to need to be pulled on the back ends of these systems in order to actually enable or uh, enact this this test? And then the launch team needs to be uh, kept in the loop so that they know you know what's coming down the pike and they can be ready and prep the systems to be able to transfer and deliver data and marketing media appropriately. So the planning team uh, in this scenario is going to generate a hypothesis. And today we'll work with a hypothesis that message A, is going to work better than message B for enticing folks who have purchased shoes to also purchase socks. Again, fairly straightforward, um, but the simpler you keep your hypotheses on the beginning, uh, the better able to be understood that hypothesis is throughout the rest of the process. The planning team then takes that hypothesis to the measurement team, and the measurement team helps identify the customers in the CRM who have purchased shoes, as well as those that have purchased shoes and socks. The goal there would be to split the customers who have only purchased shoes into the two cohorts that would receive message A and message B, and then suppress anybody in that group who has also purchased socks. This does a couple of things. It ensures that only folks who haven't purchased socks get the message, which is, which is good, but it also ensures that your uh, reach and your budget is spent most effectively and not on people who have already uh, converted in the way that you would like. It's also important to note that the split between groups A and B must be random, and it, uh, it would be good to kind of validate uh, that the split between both of those groups, uh, each group individually, represents kind of the whole uh, as, a, as a proper 50-50 uh, split. Uh, the measurement team will also identify uh, the media delivery partner. In this case, we'll just go with the DSP, uh, and they'll identify the, uh, the location in which to retrieve the point of sale transaction data uh, within their systems uh, to measure that enterprise sales lift. The launch team is then consulted on how to get this done. So. The launch team is making sure that the CRM file is in the proper format to be sent to both LiveRamp as well as the media delivery partner and downstream. Because if a file is in an improper format and the data can't be read, well, it's going to obviously impact the timing and then potentially the launch date of the test. And you know, if your test is pertaining to a specific time period in the year, that's obviously not, not uh, ideal. The launch team is also going to make sure that the campaign is set up properly uh, within the uh, agreed upon DSP. And it's important to note here that when you're, when you're setting up a campaign within a DSP and there are several groups uh, that need to be tested for one tactic, another, and suppressed, very important that there's not a third or fourth group that's also uh, being uh, added to this campaign for lookalike targeting or any other unpersonalized media that doesn't pertain uh, to this particular test. And the reason I say that is because when you begin to ent uh, introduce you know, outside uh, variables into uh, what should be a tightly controlled testing process, um, the read on the back end and the overlap of customers between any lookalike modeling or you know, broad brush uh, media delivery uh, 
kind of muddy the waters when trying to look at the true difference between groups A and B and how they performed uh, from a conversion perspective post-test. So we see that a lot with clients that, um, you know, they run a test, they get the results, and then they see on the back end that, um, you know, oh, by the way, these folks that were only supposed to receive messages A and messages B also received a litany of other messages uh, because we were maybe not aware of other campaigns going on or, uh, you know, they were already in flight and we couldn't, couldn't hold off on those. And it's just really important, again, to make sure that everybody's aware of who will be targeted and when they will be targeted so that there are no you know, lurking variables out there uh, that can interrupt the, uh, the analysis on the back end. So for this example, we would be looking at you know, enterprise sales. And the idea here is to understand if the folks that received message A, right, actually bought more on the whole, as did uh, folks that received message B. So to do that, we're gonna have to get a little bit deep into the, uh, the stats here. So we're gonna kind of nerd out for a little bit and talk about the, uh, the ones and zeros that go behind a stats test uh, when, when looking at a post-campaign uh, data set. What we use uh, at Ovative is um, uh, statistical hypotheses test. Um, and in this particular case, uh, given that you know, we're sending media to two cohorts and we're not sure exactly who may have seen uh, what message and when. We do know, though, that one group could only have seen one message and the other group could only have seen another. Uh, we use a Welch's t-test. Um, and what that does is it measures the likelihood um, that the difference that we observe between the purchase behavior of both groups, it measures the likelihood that that is uh, happened either coincidentally uh, or if it's happened as a result of uh, particular messaging tactics that were used. Uh, said a little differently, you know, the folks in cohort B have an average purchase volume of X or, or Y. They have a, a specific variance within that uh, purchase group. And then similarly, uh, group A would also have uh, a variance and an average uh, particular to them. And what a Welch's t-test does is disregards uh, any notion that the uh, the variances between these two groups are equal. It, it doesn't assume that they are, but what it's trying to do is determine whether or not the average purchase rate between these two groups is in fact different, or if it just happened by, by chance, given that each group has kind of a wide variance of, of purchase behavior of the customers within within those cohorts. A little more technically now, we're really testing a null hypothesis that group av the average purchase price of group one is low or is equal to the average purchase of group two, and that generates a t statistic that takes into account uh, the difference between those two averages as well as the variances of the group, the total uh, the the total number of consumers within that group, um, and what's called the degrees of freedom, which uh, controls for um, that T statistic uh, being uh, able to be mapped to a probability curve. When that T statistic is calculated and placed on the probability curve, we can see what the likelihood is that, in fact, uh, cohort A and cohort B had averages that are uh, statistically significant uh, to be the same. It's much easier done in Excel. Uh, in Excel, uh, what you can do is line up all of your customer records by their conversion amount, assign their group flag, and then move the group uh, flags into a two-column uh, table, aligning all uh, purchase behavior from each, from each customer uh, in the rows, and then choose the data analysis tool pack within Excel and, uh, and use the t-test uh, two-sample uh, method that assumes unequal variances. And then what that does is it assumes that neither uh, group has a variance that is equal to the other, but it doesn't. It also doesn't assume that the averages are the same either, and that's what it's testing. The test statistic that's highlighted to the right um, is the probability that the averages between those two groups are in fact the same. And for this particular test, that probability is 0.03. So that means there's a 3% chance that group two 
happen to be uh, have it, happen to have an average order value larger than group one by chance. Basically, there's a 97% chance that uh, group two received a message that enticed them to buy more than group one, which is exactly what we want to conclude, and that uh, group two, in fact, did perform better than group one, and that the messaging tactic uh, that group two received uh, did, in fact, entice them to purchase at a higher rate than group one. So to kind of summarize uh, what we just learned today, you know, it really comes down to having a cohesive process and ensuring that everybody on the t team understands their role and how they play uh, in that process to make sure the data is clean from start to finish and that proper testing can happen. Kind of observe the test that can be uh, applied a little bit more broadly uh, based on your particular vertical or our product goals. And I went through a little bit of detail on this uh, post-test analysis. So with that, um, does anybody on the line have uh, any questions on any of these three pieces that we talked about today? Hi, Nate. Can you hear me? I can. Okay. So I do, I do have questions. Um, aside from sales data, what other types of data can be used alongside CRM information to target customers? That's a good question. Um, so you can use uh, lots of different types of data. Uh, you can purchase third-party data. Um, you can uh, look at site traffic behavior um, or you know the ways in which a customer is acting or is uh, interacting with your brand online. Um, and you can feed all of that into to LiveRamp um, and segment appropriately off of, of those uh, attributes and behaviors. Great question. Next question. Can these mm -hmm. tests be used for in-flight optimization? Yes, yep. And that's kind of what we were getting at with uh, the example here. So, you know, when you have um, the ability to suppress groups that have purchased or made the conversion that you intended them to, uh, to make, during a test, or if you want to, you know, scale back an audience or, you know, adjust your frequency of impressions. Um, if you have a tightly managed process and, and all the team members understand, you know, where they fit and, and how uh, to generate data in a way that is easily transferable between client, live ramp, and display partner, well, you can quickly adjust lists within a CRM onboard those with LiveRamp, and then make changes uh, based on those lists as they're shared with the publishing partner um, on, a, on a daily basis if you need to. And my last question, is web personalization supported for targeting of test and control segments? Um, yeah, I'll let Jason talk a little bit about LiveRamp's uh, connections with partners that, that enable that. And then maybe I'll talk about uh, the methods we use to, to infer uh, you know, successful tests using those capabilities. Jason? Sure, sure, I can speak to that. Um, so yes, uh, no matter what type of data that you're onboarding to LiveRamp, you know, the idea is that you can push out those segments consistently across channels. And so, of course, we support distribution to display partners, social media, marketing platforms, DMPs, DSPs, um, but certainly web personalization providers are among our integrated partner set. Uh, so if you're thinking about or are already using something like a, a maximizer type of tool, um, we can easily send segments there. Um, and that's really, uh, it's actually a pretty powerful use case um, because what it enables is, is really uh, personalizing content to even an anonymous web visitor because you're able to, because with LiveRAM self, you can resolve that browser cookie um, or mobile device ID back to all the CRM attributes that you sent to LiveRAM that you might be using for targeting. Um, so it's a nice way to create a, a more persistent and personalized experience, and it's easy to run those types of segment campaigns in parallel 
you know, at the same time as you're running, um, you know, a display split test or a direct mail split test um, and really assess the lift, you know, from those tactics and also, you know, for the additive lift that each channel adds to that user experience. Yeah, and then, you know, I'll just reiterate again that it's it's important for everybody to know uh, in that process, you know, who is uh, receiving a personalized uh experience on the homepage and and who's not such that in the background right the measurement team can be receiving data on those customers uh, purchase behavior and then really assessing the lift in a in a similar fashion to a Welch's t-test or another uh, you know hypothesis testing method uh, that would be most appropriate for you know that particular uh, testing effort also a really good question thank you do we have any others? I haven't received any others. Um, are there any final thoughts that you'd want to share um, before we close? Um, no, I just, I, I guess I would say, um, I would like to reiterate that, you know, <laughs> this is really new. Um, the reason we focus a lot on, you know, really instilling the idea of process and people and communication is because you know the ultimate idea of an ab test is not new but in order to actually execute it there are a lot of moving pieces so you know um the stats methods on the, on the back end um those those don't work unless everybody is on the same page and knows how to to um you know, deliver uh, appropriately against their their particular function, um, and that's kind of really the sum total of it. That's where we see clients having the most issues uh, is where you know one team doesn't appropriately uh, relay communications to another, and then you know data is missed, uh, timing is missed, and uh, the the tests on the back end uh, don't mean much. Were there any other questions that came in in that time? Unfortunately, no. Um, Jason, do you have any final thoughts that you'd like to share before I, I begin? Sure. I'd absolutely echo what Neat said. I think, you know, a lot of what we're talking about here, the concepts are not necessarily new, but the applications of them and the way that they can be tied together, especially for cross-channel measurement, I think is, is pretty powerful. And it's something that even the most sophisticated marketers out there, you know, do struggle with mastering. Um, and it really comes down to having um, you know, an effective uh, centralized process, um, you know, with a with a key lead owner who's managing this end to end um, and creating clear alignment between all the teams that are involved here. Um, everything from data sourcing to actually matching that data to the end platforms, running the campaigns, sourcing the data needed back for measurement, um, you know. All of those tasks don't belong to one person or one team or even one company in most cases when we're doing this at scale. Uh, and so you know, having a, a managed services layer agency like what Ovada does really helps um, you know, do these things in a, in a smooth, streamlined way. Um, and, and, the, and the more you do it, the easier it becomes. Uh, and obviously, the more value you can drive um, as you're able to scale up these efforts um, across the board. Thank you. Um, I do want to thank everyone for joining our webcast today. A special thank you to Jason and Nate for taking the time to present their work with our webcast crowd. I hope you all have a great day and uh, can join us for our future webcasts. Thank you all. Thank you, Zena. Bye.